94.1 FM, 3WBC. The Australia Radio Show. A weekly news edition covering local and international news, sourced from Australia, Egypt, and the rest of the East and North Africa region. The country's action covers the arts, culture, trade, and politics. Sunday evening, 9 p.m. till 11 p.m. And now here's Jerry Gerges presenting the Egypt Australia Radio Show. 94.1 FM, 3WBC, the voice of the inner east. And uh, like uh, we said, it's 94.1 FM, Egypt Australia Radio Show. My name is Jerry Gerges, interviewing Professor John Long, paleontologist at Flinders University in South Australia. It is a pre-recording via Zoom on Saturday, 20th, 20th of November, 2021, and it is scheduled for broadcast 9pm Sunday, the 21st November, 2021. Last week, we had the opportunity to listen to a podcast uh, made by ABC Radio National on conversations, and the host was Richard Feidler. Um, the podcast was simply titled How a Fish with Tiny Fingers Changed Its History. Um, and it was about the human evolution story from apes to up, uh, uh, upstanding Homo sapiens. Um, is not a full story. Uh, South Australian uh, Flinders University paleontologist John Long prefers to go back more than 400 years, million years, to the Darwinian period when most of the world as we know it uh, today was underwater. John and his colleagues discovered several fish from that age. Uh, that tells us much about how we became humans. Um, last week, like we said, we played the ABC podcast and then we interviewed George Theodoridis and asked him about Greek mythology and what the Greek, uh, great uh, Athenians uh, said about evolution, Greek stories of Poseidon and how the most beautiful woman, woman uh, Aphrodite, was born in the sea and recent sea exploration stories that told about the Atlantis, the sunken city. I then invited, not, not thinking that or believing Professor John Long would accept our uh, invitation. Um, and, uh, and I said in my email, um, if he would give us this wonderful opportunity to speak to us here on 94.1 FMEs, it was really uh, the perfect for, uh, opportunity for us to run with the segment and that the segment is one question I would have asked in that interview. Well, yep. can I just say thank you, uh, uh, Professor John Long for uh, being on our radio tonight. It's a privilege and a pleasure, Jerry. And please call me John. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. Um, now, can I just, uh, mm, uh, we had a small chat before we uh, started our interview, and you yep. actually made a mention about a pro Professor Phyllis Phyllis and his student, uh, an Eximenda. Tell us all yeah. about that connection. Well, I'm not a, an expert in ancient Greek philosophy, but the, the basics of modern science really came from the ancient Greeks and the Miletian school based at Miletus had its uh, main founder called Thales. And he created some of the first concepts of scientific investigation where you had to repeat and prove an observation be before it would become acceptable. And he actually had a student called Anaximander who developed some of the very earliest ideas about evolution. You know, he actually saw creatures coming from the sea and invading land and developing legs and arms, but you know, which has been shown to be true now with the evidence of all the fossils and paleontology that we know in the modern world. But of course, in those days, it was really just an idea. Um, the difference today is that science progresses because we might get ideas, but then we have to look for evidence and proof of how 
um, these things actually work. And, and that's the difference between, you know, the work I do today, which is based on digging up fossils from mostly Australia, but I've had four expeditions to Antarctica. I've worked all around the world. Um, haven't worked in Egypt though, but I have worked in the Middle East, in, in Iran, yes. in, uh, in some of the mountain ranges there close to the Afghanistan border. I, um, if I can um, uh, go back to uh, some of the things that listening to the podcast, the ABC's podcast, um, yep. I was just, um, uh, well, it, you know, it, for one stage, I couldn't believe how the percentage of oxygen fluctuated. Mm. Um, we understand that today, as you've pointed out in the podcast, it's around 21%. But yeah. Past, it went from uh, 29 down to 13 and up to, yeah. up again to 30. And yeah. I just wanted to know how did that happen and why we don't know, but can we talk about a little about the fluctuation of... Yeah, oxygen? yeah, oxygen, absolutely. Um, you have to remember that most of the oxygen in the world today was created by living organisms that at first the algae in the sea before we had higher forms of life was photosynthesizing and producing the first oxygen, which built up very, very slowly in the atmosphere over uh, billions of years, you know, since the first life, which was 3.5 billion years ago. But the Devonian was very special because it was the time in Earth history from about 420 million years ago to when it ended 359 million years ago. That's about a 60 million year period where plants left the sea and invaded land and they went from small mosses and grasses and things like that. Well, not, not proper grasses we have here, but, but low plants, you know, a, a few inches high to the first forests. And during that time, there were periods where oxygen came out at a great amount and got really, really high. And then there was a readjustment period where plants with other plants were, and animals were drawing down oxygen and there were fluctuations until it reached an equilibrium for the first time. So it's like first experimental trees and forests are, are, are pumping out oxygen while other animals are sucking in oxygen. And it took a while for that balance. Um, I really don't know if that's the correct answer. It's the only one I can think of that, that kind of makes sense because after that period and the last soaring heights of 30% oxygen, which was in the period called the Carboniferous when all the coal was made, that's about 359 million years ago to about 300, um, um, you know, 280 million years ago, something like that. So after that, everything stabilized and oxygen has still been fluctuating a little bit, but not such big swings, um, you know. So that's about the best way we can explain it, I think. I think uh, logically that, that makes sense to me. Um, so uh, I was, I, I suppose the one question that was sort of going around in my head in, in relation to the oxygen content is that um, if there was, uh, other um, additional uh, apparatus that was in play that actually, but the, 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 the answer that you've pointed out in that in, from the start, and then the equal, equilibrium and as far as what was consumed and what was out there. Um, and are we likely to have an increase in oxygen? No, we're likely to be much the same unless you know I, I can't predict the, the, the large-scale trends I mean we know with increasing climate and increasing warming we get more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which includes water vapor which is a very powerful greenhouse gas um, as well as carbon dioxide methane and these other gases but um, it really depends on how much deforestation if we you know, take too many plants and trees away from the great jungles of the world, then we're not going to be producing as much oxygen. Uh, so it could gradually over a long period of time decrease. Uh, but it would be a long period of time. It wouldn't be instantaneous because there's still plants in the sea, algae and, and plankton that, that photosynthesize. And that's the vast majority of plants in the world, really, are these things in the ocean, not necessarily the plants on land. I, I, uh... 
and again, once again, what was explained in the ABC podcast, how a fish was with tiny uh, fingers uh, changed history. Your, um, your, um, your academic and your passion for paleontology started off in Lilydale in Victoria. <laughs> and it did, it did. I'm a Melbourne boy, born and bred. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I can tell you the story. I was uh, in grade two and school and the kid I sat next to invited me to come fossil hunting with him and his dad. Yeah. And we took me to a quarry in Lilydale where you could smash rocks with a hammer and there were soft mudstones and they would split and you'll get all sorts of sea creatures there like fossil shells and bits of ancient uh, bugs called trilobites so a bit like early crustaceans if you like and I just became hooked because it meant that where I was standing in this paddock in Lilydale with a little hole in the ground it wasn't a giant quarry it was just a small hole in the side of a hill was once under the sea and so it impresses upon you the the wonder of geology that you know you can be standing in a place and all through the time going back it was a different environment. It could be under the sea or top of a mountain, depending, you know. That, that is, I love the story. And, and I think um, just to draw on that, um, I know with um, a lot of the uh, archaeology that happens in Egypt with the NGO uh, uh, yeah. groups that have, uh, operate over there, they tend to invite anyone, people like myself, yeah. who know nothing about archaeology or geology. Um, as, as a matter of fact, as far as geology is concerned, I was asked by a friend of mine who is a professional geologist in Queensland said, come over because I need people who do particular things. And I, was, yeah. I ended up being a dirt bagger for, for while I was on, on holidays. But, uh, yeah. that was geology. but going back to um, archaeology, um, the groups usually uh, invite people to come over and participate as long as you feed yourself and all of that. You can. Mm. Do you have the same programs for um, uh, uh, paleontology? Uh, we do at Flinders University. We have a, a club called the Flinders University Paleontology Society or FUPS, yeah. and anyone can join. They don't have to be a student at the university, and they run field trips for people that want to have their first taste of fossil hunting. Um, I tend to go to very remote and specialist kind of places. Yeah. And I work with teams of people I've already trained. Yes. Uh, so I don't tend to take members of the public on those trips. Right. But um, there are lots of ways people can join in fossil hunting trips uh, with the local clubs, local geological field naturalist societies and local geological societies in every state will take people out to see geology sites and sometimes to collect fossils. Wow. I'll, I'll, I'll look, uh, look that up and, and maybe... Um, but you've also had fascinating um the uh, the um the um the, the way of describing and explaining things to kids as well you've got several books and and i think i believe you've got one uh, that's already been pub but published um not by you by another author about you yes yes danielle claude who's an award-winning writer in her own respect uh, wrote this book for a publisher in Victoria called Wild Dingo Press, who have written a book, series of books about Aussie STEM stars or people that um, do science in Australia. It includes myself with the latest book, um, Alan Finkel, Fiona Wood, who was Australian of the Year for Spray on Skin, um, Gisela Kaplan, who studies birds and loads of people in it mathematician Eddie Wu who's a maths teacher so yeah it's all about encouraging kids in the exciting careers that one can have in science um, which is a great way to you know earn a living if all the places I've been in my life I've been four times to Antarctica digging out fossils I've been to Africa and America and China and yeah it's, it's a it's it's a great career if you can get onto this sort of thing <laughs> well you know um one of the things that um you know, just participating uh, with my geologist friend up in, in uh, Queensland, north, far north east Queensland, um, was that I, in, in, in the uh, um, uh, exploration uh, sites, we came up, well, I came across and, and it, it looked like thin paper of 
ink. You know how we in the old days used to have carbon copies of everything. Yeah. And you're stuck to yes, yeah. Well, this yep. is exactly that. And I picked it up thinking that it was carbon copy that somebody left behind. It was, in fact, oil. All right. You know yeah. I really yeah. I picked it up and I took a photo. And when I went back to the camp and I said, this is what I came across. And, and they said, exactly what was the longitude, altitude kind of thing. And I said, I've got it on my Garmin. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we went back and, and there was something, a huge thing um, for the geologist. Um, yeah. So that, yep. that that. Um, just going to your podcast, uh, John. Um, yeah. Now, you also mentioned, um, sorry, just just on the oxygen content, and I, I remember documentaries were taken when um, there was uh, a lot of drilling in snow. And when they... They dug really, really deep in the snow, and there was a lot of analysis of the. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, I the, know what you're saying, Gary. This is the ice cores in Antarctica, yes. so the ice is very thick. You know, several kilometers thick yes. in Antarctica, uh, two, three kilometers thick in places, yes. and so the ice cores go down, and ice builds up as snow, as you said, but it turns to ice after the snow hardens, yes. and so you get layers that can go back, you know, several hundred thousand years, if not up to a million years, right. to trap tiny bubbles of air yes. in that ice and snow. And so that's how we can measure the levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere going back the last million years with, with very precise accuracy. And the accuracy of the 380 million or um, earlier, that's depending on the, we're talking about the, crust of the earth now and no no to, to get um oxygen levels going back tens or hundreds of millions of years yes. you have to get analyses of uh shell uh right. bits of shell or bone that actually you know trap amounts of oxygen when they're forming the, the carbon or the calcite bonds and so on right. so it's the oxygen levels are trapped by there's different isotopes of oxygen, like oxygen 16, oxygen 18, and all of this. And the ratios, one's heavier than the other. Yes. So, uh, you know, they, they can tell you things like the levels of oxygen relative to other elements and so on. It's very complicated and it's yes. not the thing I do. I actually study the bones and the fossils themselves and rely on my colleagues to do those calculations. Yes. But it's, you can trust me, it is a reliable way of doing it, yeah. And it's like you said, it's it's all integrated and, you know, um, yeah, uh, just sticking to paleontology then. <laughs> I know yeah. you're knowledgeable about everything else, but uh, you're in the area of your profession. Um, I was just going to go back to, um, you also mentioned, and that, that bit I didn't know, um, when mammals went back to the sea and you yes, that's right. spoke about whales. Yeah, yeah. That's so we have the earliest, yeah, the whales are, are mammals, uh, have evolved from mammals that were living on land. And if we do the analysis of their DNA, which is the most accurate way of looking at what are their living closest relatives on land, we get hippopotamus. Right. So the hippopotamus family goes back and joins up with the whale family back about 65 or 60 million years ago and so animals like hippopotamus uh, were, were living near the sea not so much in rivers where they live today and they had longer sort of snouts and they were catching fish and eventually they went into the water and became more aquatic um, and they developed uh, longer bodies and the limbs at the front developed into sort of flippers and we have a whole range of fossil whales from ones with four legs to ones with just flippers and everything in between. So you can see the changes in the limbs as they evolve into fully aquatic animals that no longer need to come onto land to breed. That's when they're true whales. That is amazing. That is, it's yeah. just because of... And, and, yeah. and if I can just say that Egypt is one of the best places in the world to study fossil whales. There are sites out there um, in the deserts that have Eocene limestones that are like 40 million years old that I think the pyramids were built of these kind of limestones. But in certain places, they get beautiful, complete fossils of these early whales and even some of these walking whales being found there. So, um, yeah, Egypt's very famous for its 
fossil whale story. <laughs> wow. Well, that there's. Uh, thank you for adding th that information. I personally didn't know anything about that either. Um, um, the so uh, last week, like we said, we were talking about how we there was the um, the transition from sea back on land and we talked about the index um, being developing um, with these sea creatures and, and the hypothesis is, it's not the null hypothesis, but yeah. I, can, I can have a 95% skewed in my favour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, is that we've come from the sea, we will, all, we will go back to the sea. Obviously, we're not, as humans, we're going to go back. But with the... Um, the thoughts about sea uh, level rising, the climate change, the sun temperatures, all of yep. the elements that are adding up would at least suggest to us, think about the land mass, which is a sea mass of 70% that's covering the earth, is mm, yeah. oceans. And should we, instead of shooting to the stars, should we encompass the oceans and live above or near the sea environment. Yeah, I think so. I think it's more likely than going to another planet, which is just horrendously costly when it would be cheaper to build cities under the sea or on in Antarctica, which is a vast continent uh, that could be, I mean, it's preserved for, uh, to keep it pristine today, but you know, in the event of an ecosystem collapse, it would be an obvious place to build big uh, cities because it's got unlimited energy from the sun, um, but you have to grow your food in hydroponic, you know, um, sort of systems and so on. But yeah, when you think of the cost of getting, say, 10 people to Mars, you could build vast cities under the, under the ocean much cheaper. Um, and perhaps we could build them without too much impact on the, on the sea itself because if you, if you can build cities that are suspended in the water rather than, you know, they, they're not going to interfere too much with the ecosystems around them. But I'm not, I'm not a, you know, gun ecologist. You'd have to get someone to, to study that. But the other thing is just to curb the population of humans so we don't need to do that. Um, we can't just keep expanding because we're like bacteria in a test tube that's going to eat ourselves out of all our resources yeah. if we kept expanding at the same rate. You know, in 1800s, there were about, 1800, there were about 2 billion, 1 billion people on the planet. And in 1900, there were 2 billion. And then by the 1980s, there's like 5 billion. And now there's like 7.5 billion. So if we keep growing at that rate, uh, you know, we're going to run out of resources eventually. And that, that's a big problem. <clears throat> um, I'm glad you... Um you somewhat agree with my hypothesis. It's just a, a, a question, but that, that's obvious to the layman. Um, in, in my case, I, you know, if, if we were to encompass living like above or below or need the water or the oceans in this case, um, again, we would go through the process of, you know, giving us another uh, opportunity to give us another two, three hundred years um, before we again do the wrong thing by uh, Mother Earth and, and, and then you know, 300 years from now we'll probably develop another means of living somewhere else. Yeah, I do think we're on the right track though with, with um, the sustainable, to live sustainably on this planet, there's lots of wonderful developments happening. You know, once we start using all electric transport and we you will have to make some sacrifices we will have to change some of the things we're used to doing and maybe eat less meat because of all the methane that the animals produce i'm not saying we give it up we just you know sustain agriculture in a, in a way that's less a burden on the planet you know um, and fishing sustainably most of about 50 percent of the fish we eat now is actually from aquaculture mm -hmm. because wild stocks are actually deplenishing uh, as we know from overfishing and so on yeah. and the price goes up and up and up if, as they become rarer and rarer but we can grow a lot of very nice fish sustainably as well through aquaculture but you know i think we just have to curb our lifestyle and use less energy and start adapting to a sustainable lifestyle and then 
you know, we can we can live in bigger cities and have more green around. You know, one of the research things that's going on at Flinders at the moment by another lab there uh, is that they're looking at the microbiome of bacteria that lives within the human. And the more you are out in nature and you get more of these good bacteria into your system, the healthier you become. You know, playing with mud and growing up as kids, playing in outdoors is actually the best thing you can do to, to build up resistance to disease and things like that. Um, so there's more research being done along those lines that show nature is actually going to be important to interact with, not just people in cities can either live in cities and not come into contact with a lot of the natural world, or they can live at the fringe and, and or live in the country and have lots of nature around them, like I do up in the Adelaide Hills. You know, it's just beautiful up here. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's an important part of the equation for the future, that we have to live sustainably and we have to live with nature and respect nature. Uh, John, uh, again, I sincerely thank you. I didn't think that I would ever get the opportunity to speak to you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, again, uh, uh, thank you ever so much for giving us your time today. And I know it's the weekend, and, and for, for that, I should just say thanks and, and speak to you sometime in the future. All right. Thank you, Jerry. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I hope your, um, your listeners have enjoyed this. So we're, we're done?